My name is Josh Hurry, and I'm the Community Relations Coordinator here at the Saskatchewan SPCA. And I'd just like to start off uh, today's webinar by thanking uh, everyone who helped to prepare, helped to prepare the webinars, um, starting with the planning committee. Uh, so thank you, Rev Neat from Sask Pork, uh, Mary Ann from the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Tanil from the Saskatchewan Poultry Council, Lorraine. Uh, who is also one of our speakers today from the Saskatchewan Veterinary Medical Association. And from our office, thank you to Sandra and Crystal as well. So we uh, will move forward and um, we will have an opportunity for questions uh, at, the present, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so we encourage you to use the uh, chat, sorry, the Q&A option uh, down at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice there's a Q&A button in the tab there. Uh, you can pop that open and ask any questions that you may have. Um, and without uh, any further ado, I'll introduce our speaker, Lorraine. So Lorraine Sienko is a registered veterinary technologist uh, and the assistant to the registrar at the Saskatchewan Veterinary Medical Association. And her presentation today uh, will be uh, telling us what it was like working in the Fort McMurray evacuation zone uh, during the wildfires that happened there a few years back. Um, so as a registry, registered veterinary technologist, Lorraine has had a varied career that includes serving on the faculty of a post-secondary education and working in small animal veterinary practice and in a mixed animal veterinary practice. Lorraine has been involved in the response to a number of major Canadian emergency situations, including wildfires in Fort McMurray and Southern Saskatchewan. Her family has a farming operation at Blaine Lake, where they grain farm, raise beef cattle, and have horses. Lorraine enjoys volunteering with many organizations and spends her holiday time going to spay neuter clinics, or as she likes to call them, spaycations, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and even the Dominican Republic. Lorraine, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I, I definitely am feeling the lack of spaycations these days, and <laughs> because, uh, because of the pandemic. So what other way to give back and to help start raising some more awareness about wildlife filed wildfire emergencies than uh, do some, you know, do some webinars um, and share my experiences with everybody. Sorry, I can't see everybody's uh, faces. Um, I try to be quite funny. Um, I'm also very, um, very nervous for some reason today not sure why um but i do try to throw in some humor and i'm quite laid back so definitely if you have questions pop them in the q a i will try to keep up with them if i miss them i will get to them at the end um but i like to tell my story so most of this is going to be through storytelling today so thanks um to the saskatchewan spca for putting this all together and uh letting me talk which i'm very good at by the way so we'll start off with just a couple of short video clips here. I mean, we've had four significant fires in the last five days or so. So that's, that's pretty intense. You don't see much sign of this fire this morning. Thankfully, the cool temperatures overnight have helped firefighters, but make no doubt it is likely still burning behind me. Hasty exit. That might have been the last time. Might have been the last time I ever saw my house right there. It's like Armageddon here. There's nobody on the road. Nothing. Absolutely nobody. Cars are burnt. There's people on the side of the road with crying babies and dogs and broken cars and no gas and no food. And it's just, it's like it's in a movie. I've never seen anything like this in my life. All Albertans are watching this. All Albertans are with the people of Fort McMurray. The end of days. <laughs> Literally, if you look around, there's people panicking. But I need to show you, it, it's not just on the border. This is Fort McMurray burning this afternoon. Uh, we're right in the thick of it. This is Highway 63, the main corridor, and we're in downtown. We're not far from a fire station, to be honest. This is insane. Holy. Well, 
Oh, you can feel the heat. <laughs> Holy shit. This is fucking crazy. Yeah, it was just this automatic panic. Um, fear. I'm thankful that we got out alive, but uh, I lost a lot. We successfully evacuated. Eighty-eight thousand people. No one is hurt, and no one has passed away right now. I really hope that we get to the end of this and we can still say that. We are here. We are strong. And we will keep doing our job. Thank you very much. So that's just a, a reminder of, of what uh, Fort Mac looked like. And now we're going to take another look. This is to get everybody in the mood. Um, a solemn mood, unfortunately. But we will get into uh, the interesting stuff in just a minute. So let's just take a look at one more video clip, a news clip here. And this one is from the one example of the Southern Saskatchewan fires. Grass fires on Tuesday were pushed across large parts of west central Saskatchewan by 100 kilometer an hour winds. Firefighters came from Prince Albert, Swift Current, and everywhere in between. Hundreds of residents of Burstall, Leader, the Red Pheasant Cree Nation, and other communities were told to leave immediately. They grabbed what they could and fled. Many of them ended up here in Kindersley. They were helped at this local evacuation center by RCMP, town officials, and an army of volunteers. Evacuees were put up in local hotels and homes. This morning, they woke up not knowing if they'd have a home to return to. First all resident Arlene Morrow says she was relieved to hear the fire was out and that they could head home. And now I'm heading home. How do you feel? Happy I get to go home, even if there isn't hydro. <laughs> Morrow and others enjoyed a breakfast of pancakes and coffee. They thanked volunteers, got in their cars, and headed home. Evacuees say they're grateful to all the volunteers in Kindersley who've helped them. But most of all, they're grateful to the firefighters across the province who risk their lives to help. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Kindersley. <coughs> so this is why that we're talking about this today is because these things really impacted a lot of people's lives. So in Fort Mac, over 88,000 people. And even in southwestern Saskatchewan, there were thousands of people uh, people affected by this, by these fires. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the things what we've learned from. And I'm going to go back a little bit in history, a brief couple of slides, um, a little bit about the La Ronge fire, tell my story about Fort Mac, um, talk a little bit about what we did with the leader, Burstall, Tompkins fires, and the whole basically southwest corner of Saskatchewan. Um, and then a little bit about the bigger fire and what we've learned since then. Um, and all the way along, I mean, we're going to be thinking about the livestock versus companion animal piece. And, and there's some similarities, but there's some difference, especially in some of the logistics pieces. And then talk a little bit about thinking about other emergencies. So there's floods, there's snowstorms, there's tornadoes. Um, there's not just fires that can occur. So those are some of the things that, you know, we need to keep at the top of our minds to be able to help the health and welfare of animals and um, think about the health and safety of, of people as well. And about following the rules. I think I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here, all listening to this, but um, why is emergency and preparedness important? <laughs> we talk about the human safety piece. Um, people who need to evacuate, they, they need to evacuate. And we've, we've seen in the past where, um, you know, people we call rogue um, will go and try to rescue animals um, and, and not follow the protocols and the health and safety that, you know, incident command has set up and they put themselves and other people at risk. So they risk um, the lives of the emergency personnel. Um, there's legal implications and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But when we have to evacuate animals for their safety, they need to be evacuated in a systematic manner, systematic manner. 
Um, the health and mental well-being of the animal needs to be taken into effect as well. And, and the people need to know what they're doing and work with the emergency personnel, the incident command system, which I will talk about a little bit. Um, and biosecurity and also doing things legally and also the human animal bond. Um, so pets owners and pets feel anxiety when, when emergencies happen and the healing process after a disaster can go more smoothly if, if owners can have some peace of mind knowing that their animals will be helped. Um, and we have to remember that some people will not leave their homes if their pets or their livestock are at risk or perishing in a disaster. They will stay with them to try to do everything they can to save them. So just thinking back about some of the major events that we've had in Western Canada. Um, so we had it, we had Slave Lake in 2011, which really hit the news. We've had lots of fires and things since then, but but Slave Lake was a big one. And then we think back to Alberta floods 2013 and uh, how, you know, Calgary, High River, just underwater. Um, and then we get to here at home where we have Larange and that was huge. That was, you know, one of the bigger fires that we've had that risked a lot of people's lives and a lot of animals lives. Of course, then we have Fort McMurray, which I have a lot of experience with. Um, and then we have Southwest Saskatchewan and then of course, BC 2018 and the Argo bush at around bigger in 2019. So you can see every single year we have had something happen and and i just don't want to talk about uh, a 2020 we'll just won't go there <laughs> um so this little logo that i have set up here is disasters aren't a spectator sport um and people do stop to take pictures and gawk um at emergency situations we've all seen it whether it's a car accident or a fire or or something like that um but we have to remember that disasters aren't that spectator sport. Um, the people who do stop and take those pictures and videos and they gawk, they're actually putting themselves and others in danger. Um, so it's just really important to always follow what emergency personnel are telling you. And if they're telling you to move on, keep traffic flowing in the, you know, the far right lane or far left lane, just to keep, keep doing that because the more, the more people that are around there, the more hazards there could be. I see there's chatting going on, which is excellent. It's nice to see. So the cost of these disasters, it just keeps going up and up. Um, you know, Fort McMurray's in the, you know, trillions of dollars um, damage. But if we look at the burn number of acres in Fort Mac, it was over a million acres that were burned. Um, we, we look at the LaRange fire, it was a lot. That's a lot of acres for Saskatchewan, um, 234, just about 235,000. Uh, we look at the buildings destroyed, the money, the fatalities, even one fatality is too many. So, you know, it just, these, these things cost, they cost money, um, but also they cost lives. And this isn't even talking about the animals that have been lost. So a little bit about the LaRange fire. <clears throat> Um, NAR, which is Northern Animal Rescue, um, they led the rescue effort. This was not an event I was involved in. Um, so all my information is I've, I've met with NAR, I've met with people who were involved with it. So this is, you know, some of the learnings of um, this, this is all based on what we've learned. So we can't criticize for what happened in the past, um, because everybody at that time every time we've had an emergency, we've learned and we've gotten more knowledge and we're doing a better job. So in 2015, NAR did an amazing job with a rescue, with their rescue effort. They did the best job they could with the resources they had. We didn't know a lot about animal rescue in the event of an emergency. The vet college assisted them and that could have seriously depleted their staffing, but they managed to keep going and they did a great job. There's always biosecurity risks when you start taking animals out of um, out of homes um, to try to rescue them and you start putting them all together. There's definitely biosecurity risks and that's to um, anybody who's ho holding animals at their, you know, at their homes or at a kennel or at a or or just any facility in general. 
<clears throat> and then they had other res rescues that assisted them. Um, you know, they did have some an issues with animals not being returned. And when you have a mass amount of people trying to help, things just fall through the cracks and that's no fault of anyone. Um, they had animals in various locations across the province and no staging because they didn't have the resources um, to be able to host animals in one location. They didn't have the manpower. Um, and so if this happens again, hopefully we can help groups like NAR do a better job in the future. <clears throat> there was no formal guard interim guardian. So, you know, there was, there's a few things we learned from this going into 2016. Like I said, biosecurity and animal health was definitely a concern. So we get to 2016, we've learned a lot from Fort McMurray, we've learned a lot from High River. Now we're in 2016 and it's May and the weather's nice, but it's dry. <clears throat> so we have this fire and we have a group of people. We have the Alberta SPCA, Alberta Vet Med Association, um, the Alberta Spay Neuter Task Force, which has now um, changed the name to Canadian Spay Neuter Task Force. We um, had a center, a reunification center. We rescued animals from Fort Mac, and I'm going to tell you how it was done. And a little bit of problems and what we learned. And there is a whole report that the ABVMA did put together. And um, anybody can look that up. Just making sure there's no questions here that I need to answer right away. Alrighty, so I'm going to tell you my story and hopefully touch on all of those things I told you I was going to talk about. So in May 2016, I was headed off to Bonneville area for a, a big spay neuter clinic. Um, we set up, which this is one of our setups, and we did about 30 surgeries and it was, I believe, a Friday. So the next morning we packed up and we headed off to Edmonton. love to say it was just an ordinary day but it definitely wasn't we headed to Edmonton um, to work with the Alberta Vet Med Association and the Alberta SPCA to set up where all of the evacuated pets from Fort McMurray would be sent to and so it was this huge center called the Nexus Center and I'll show you pictures here right away but we had this place all set up we had um, you know a rooms for examining rooms for dogs rooms for exotics rooms for cats you know, isolation areas, um, you know, an initial exam area, a little bit of treatment area. We had a big mash unit clinic set up in this huge warehouse. So we waited and waited and waited some more until the middle of the night when the first animals ar uh, arrived in Edmonton. Um, the first load was brought in by a cattle liner, which you'll see on the left hand side of your screen. Um, and we learned very quickly that the animals weren't able to regulate their temperatures in a livestock trailer. Um, so a lot of them came in not, not feeling great, um, but they did okay. Um, we managed to get there, to, you know, the group that was there, I had already left to come back to Saskatoon. Um, the group that was there managed to get everybody's temperatures back to normal and get them all comfortable and, and settled for, for a stay so that they could eventually be reunited with their owners. So after this initial load of people, um, there was city buses and designated private vehicles for use to bring these animals um, from Fort McMurray down to Edmonton. So <clears throat> a few days later, I actually was heading to Edmonton to help take care of evacuated pets. They needed a lot of people, a lot of manpower to take care of all of these animals, walking, um, you know, doing physical exams, you know, cleaning kennels, feeding, everything. So I have friends up there. I'm going to go up there. I got a phone call during my drive and I was rerouted towards Fort Mac. Um, but they wanted me to transport drugs. So um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, narcotics drugs can only be handled by licensed, um, licensed vets and licensed techs. And so because I'm licensed in Alberta, I was luckily, um, I was the only one heading up to Fort Mac that day that was, so I had to stop and pick up a bunch of controlled drugs so that we would have pain management um, up there in, in Fort McMurray. Um, so I had to wait for the drugs. I had to wait 
for clearance to go. So I had to have my license. I had to have my phone number, my email, uh, my name, everything submitted up to Fort McMurray um, because there was a checkpoint at Fort McMurray and we needed clearance before we could even go. So we had to wait for the clearance. And even when you got the clearance to go when you were in Edmonton, you had no guarantee at the checkpoint that was just a few miles outside of Fort McMurray. So you could drive for three, four hours and have to turn around and come home. So this was my route. I was hoping to stop like right here at this uh, very long Highway 16 and just head straight to Athabasca. Um, but instead I had to go to Edmonton all the way to Fort Mac. Um, but the bonus was I did not have to take my own vehicle to Fort McMurray. I was actually able to leave my vehicle at Edmonton and take a different vehicle um, so that I didn't have to have my truck smell like forest fire for years. So there is always a silver lining. So this was about Boyle and North um, that it was thick. The smoke was thick. Um, you had to have headlights, uh, reduce speed. You couldn't see the city. Um, so you were basically right in the city. It was, it was crazy. Um, and the smoke was really bad. So when we got up there, where did we eat, sleep and shower? We had cots. Um, we were set up in the RM of Wood Buffalo. They had a, a municipal building we were set up in that was attached to the SPCA. And we used the Fort Mac SPCA linens to sleep with. So luckily there was some comfy dog blankets and things like that we could use. We showered in buildings like this that had showers like this. So we had, um, and we really didn't sleep much. Um, you didn't sleep because you didn't know when you were going to be evacuated next. Um, the other thing, we had no heat. Um, we had electricity and water. So we were lucky it was May because it wasn't too cold. Um, but we definitely didn't sleep when we were there. Um, that was one of the things that was, you just didn't know. You didn't know whether you we're going to get woken up to be evacuated. Um, you were worried about the animals, your friends. Um, it was definitely a little torturesome on the emotions and the brain, that's for sure. So Fort McMurray, um, this is looking kind of northwards. There's where the Fort McMurray SPCA is. It's right on the outside skirts of the, of the town, of the city, I should say. Um, and then this is, we just walked or drove over to here to Keanu College where they had, um, most of the firefighters were, were actually slept there on cots. Um, we avoided walking there just because of the time it would take. And if, if something happened, um, we wanted to have a vehicle so we could get out of Dodge. <clears throat> so Alberta SPCA was putting out, um, social media posts, um, about how things were going to work. Um, and where to state where your pet was. Um, if your pet was still up in Fort McMurray, they did have a, a website you could go put a, a report to. So we had, we had teams. So when we were up there, we had teams. I was on the team that actually stayed at the SPCA and did health, um, health stuff and arranging dogs for transport, um, you know, doing things like doing physical exams and making sure these animals were stable enough to go down um, to Edmonton. But we did have teams. So we had teams of animal handlers um, and an, uh, the animal handlers were paired with a peace officer or an RCMP officer. And they were dispatched um, from our staging area from that, um, <coughs> from the SPCA um, to go and collect um, dogs they had to have permission to go into homes. Um, so they would go out every day and, and get animals. We had to have permission to go into people's homes. We were hoping people would tell us where the spare key was. Um, but there were lots of animals that did were let loose or escaped um, that were also trapped. So it was um, a big feat, but every um, anybody who was rescuing animals from Fort McMurray had to have a peace officer or an RCMP officer with them. Alrighty, then we were able to get some animals out. So this was actually a city bus that we loaded um, that was full of um, lots of different creatures, as well as you can see a tank that I can't remember what that was in, what was in there, but definitely not dogs or cats. Um, 
we had to have temperature controlled. So this was um, what we utilized. And this was one of the first loads of animals that went out. So knight in shining armor, or as I like to say, idiot wrapped in tinfoil, um, which is right there. Rescue, there were some rescue warriors that had no jurisdiction or affiliation with the Alberta SPCA's effort to get animals out. Um, so they took on a lot of personal risk, animal risk. Um, there was biosecurity issues, there were stolen animals, and these people are good intentioned, but they're very biased and they don't understand what the risks are and what the issues are related to what they were doing. So they were going in kind of like rogue, um, and people who do go in rogue, they, they risk their own lives um, and they risk those who need to go rescue them or, or find them. So they take away from that planned effort, which means moving resources around and making everything, um, again, riskier and the resources spread even thinner. So um, I know there was a lot of people were upset on how long these processes take to get animals out or deal with these emergencies. And the reason it takes so long is because we try to do it in a systematic manner that keeps people safe, which is the primary pri priority, and then animals safe. Um, and I don't know how many rogue rescuers there were because we just don't know. We know they were there. We hear about things, things like that on social media posts. Um, you know, you hear it through the grapevine, but you just never know how many people actually went out on their own um, away from the effort. And uh, definitely it's... Uh, it's one of those things that when you ask emergency personnel about the people who go in rogue, um, it, it spreads their resources quite thin. Okay. So we did get put on alert for evacuation partway through my stay. Um, the winds had changed and the fire was actually turning back towards the city. And amazingly enough, there was not, there was some still bush left to burn. We had about a two hour warning. Um, so we prepped ourselves, we prepped animals because um, we had enough time and warning. We were able to maybe prep some kennels to get some animals out with us as we left. So we made a plan for that. We did manage to have a quick supper. We didn't sleep that night because we were on an alert, but um, they actually were able to hold the fire and we didn't need to evacuate that night, um, which was really nice. But it rained ash. And this is, yes, all ash. Um, we were supplied with respirators and masks. Which we're all used to these days anyways, right? Um, this is just a picture from Fort McMurray. And then finally evacuation. So obviously, this is the last day we any of us were actually up there. Um, we did have one final evacuation. And so... Here we are, Fort McMurray SPCA, and I just put the map out here so you, I've got some things coming up. So we had to grab our stuff, and we were given 30 minutes to grab our things. Um, we were able to grab a couple of animals and load each vehicle. Um, so there's a stop sign up ahead. So we hopped in the truck um, with our animals. I had two birds and three cats. I don't think I had any dogs with me. Um, so we got to this corner and we stopped at that corner and we were told you better have everything because you're not going back. Um, all right. No, we had everything and you know, thanks for everything. And they thanked us and they're like, get going. So we turned that corner and there is fire on both sides of the highway and up the middle in between in the Meridian. Um, I couldn't hit that gas pedal fast enough. Actually it was a diesel truck, correct myself. Um, but it was hammer down and and get home we we had to just get out of there so with that fire coming back in again we we're like nope we're gone we're done so we headed back for edmonton uh, we were able to do some reunions so happy stories now um these were two great pyrenees dogs that were under my under my care um the fort mac spca did have outdoor runs for dogs but the air quality was so poor and the risks were so high that they only had um, short outdoor times on good days um, we were able to do a few reunions with the animals. Um, these two reunions were done with um, some of the other volunteers, but I was able to um, return the two birds and the, I believe, three cats. Um, 
So people offered to pay us. They had feed us feed us. They had tears of joy in their eyes, knowing that their family member has now reunited with them. Um, we took no money. Um, we took no food. Just the gratefulness of these people getting their animals back was, was payment enough. Um, many people donated to the Alberta Spay Neuter Task Force or the Alberta SPCA or another charity to show their thankfulness, which none of us really required. We just were happy to see people get their animals back. Um, this is one cat. This is a bit of a miracle story. Um, Dexter. So Dexter was actually a lost cat about six to eight weeks prior to Fort McMurray. So he, you know, went disappeared end of March or sometime in, you know, in March. Um, and he was actually found during the rescue loose, um, brought into the Fort McMurray SPCA and he was recognized. Um, he was matted. He was scared. Um, he was definitely an ashy gray, not beautiful white like that. Um, but he was alive with great prognosis. So we slowly started him back on food so he wouldn't overeat. And uh, his owners were actually way out on the East Coast with, the, with their family after being evacuated. And they had considered Dexter gone forever until they received a lovely phone call that he was alive. Um, so we brought him back to Edmonton. He was actually one of the cats that was with me when we came back and he got reunited with his owner um, after someone paid for his flight to be reunited with his family. So then this was just a thank you that we had received for getting him back home. So that's Dexter after Fort Mac, back with his family, very happy. So lots of happy stories and, and he got to experience the East Coast. So a few stats from Fort Mac. Um, we had over a thousand animals admitted to the reunification center. Um, there was about 940 animals reunited with their owners. Um, but there was about, there was almost 200 that we had no owner contact for. And there was no, there wasn't an, um, a report put in for those animals. So they were sent with another rescue after a period of time. Um, I think it was two or three months. Those animals eventually were, were put with, um, a rescue and adopted out. There was over 175 veterinary practices that offered support and over 100 vets and vet techs that were working around the clock to help with the rescue effort and multiple other volunteers as well. I, I don't even know how many, there was hundreds of people that helped out with this. So I did go back to Fort Mac a year later um, to do a spay neuter clinic. Um, many of the volunteers that I did work with were actually traumatized and couldn't go back. I'm a little different. I like to say I'm a little weird maybe to even to say I needed the closure. Um, I needed to see Fort McMurray and the community healing. And so going back and it was, it was a no brainer and it was the best decision I ever made. It was amazing. Um, so here's driving up into Fort Mac. Um, you can see things are greening up trees are burned. Um, there's still some emergency lighting and things that are still sticking around and you'll see fire breaks all over the place that were cut with cats. Um, this was a major flashback. So one morning we got up and it was foggy and we just were like, whoa, fog. Okay, we honestly had a flashback about uh, the year before where it was all smoke. But you can see there's miles and miles of, of trees just burnt everywhere. Um, this is some of the houses that were standing. You can see the siding on these houses are all melted away and had still hadn't been replaced yet. And then there's lots of new homes going up too. So this is all a burnt area um, and there's brand new homes going up already a year later. We also got to support local, which was nice. Um, the Wood Buffalo Brewing Company was amazing to us. So it was nice to be able to support local and and be able to unwind and relax after, after a day of spaying and neutering critters. So one last look at Fort Mac when we left, it was just beautiful up there. And then in 2017, in the fall, we had the leader Burstall Tompkins, whole Southwest Saskatchewan and part of Alberta, Eastern part of Alberta, it was on fire. And so you can see, this is a big, big corner of the province right in here. Um, and those were just the bigger fires that we were talking about in this one. 
So October 16th, 17th, this fire takes off. There's evacuations. There's multiple fires all over Southwest Saskatchewan. On October 18th, there was a veterinarian that was called to help evaluate livestock that were in that path of destruction that night. And I got a phone call and they were, I had a phone call, asked for help. What do we do? Um, so we had to plan for backup. Um, there's not a lot of veterinarians in that area of the province or veterinary technologists. So we had to come up with a way that we could be able to help um, and provide some backup service. So I got involved because of course I have a lovely book that has every single licensed vet and tech in there. And I started making phone calls and said, hey, you're licensed. Would you be able to give us a hand if we need help? And we did, we had, we had a lot of people that lived in the area or close to that were willing to help out if we need it. And I said, you know what, we'll wait. We've got somebody going there. We're gonna figure out what we need before we start activating people to go into this area because we might need some special clearance from the emergency personnel. So we had that. Um, we had losses. So after this fire, um, Sask Agriculture received reports about 800 livestock dead. Um, I do know for a fact that there were producers that didn't report. So we're looking at over a thousand livestock that perished in this fires. So this is um, one snapshot of what it looked like, um, which was scary. Um, just gonna make sure I don't have a... Okay, we're good. Making sure I'm not missing anything. Um, so we're looking at this and we're looking at, you know, the day, maybe two days after this, this fire went through um, and producers are starting to look at, at their herds to find out, you know, what's left, where they are. Um, and uh, I was talking to this veterinarian because we were, we were talking on a almost hourly basis at times. Um, one of the veterinarians I talked to was talking to a producer in the pasture and could hear the neighbor shooting his cows. Um, he was also helping, she was also helping a producer use a, a repeater syringe to treat some animals. Um, and his hand started shaking because this syringe looked and kind of felt like the resemblance of a gun. And he had just shot a bunch of his cows. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of psychological and mental health issues that came about with this because I mean, people were finding dead animals all over the place and finding their own animals. Um, the question was, do you know why producers um, wouldn't report the dead, dead stock? Um, I don't know why. Um, some of it might have had to do with the fact that they only had a few head. They didn't think it was worthwhile um, and they just buried the animals on their own property. Um, some just didn't want, um, they wanted to remain anonymous and they felt like if they told the government um, if they lost animals that they would lose their anonymity. Um, so there was some concerns around that. Um, we encouraged as many people as we could, the producers we knew um, to report it in because we wanted to know the mass scope to be able to prepare for this to be better in the future. Um, like I said, um, producers were shocked. Um, they were upset. It was, you know, it was just hard. They were, like I said, they were kill having to kill their own cows on mass. So what happened next was um, someone from the animal health unit at Sask Agriculture, myself and um, the veterinary social worker at the vet college, we had many conversations. And so we were tasked with a few different things. Um, we were exploring methods of support for livestock producers. So mental health support, making sure they had the veterinary support they needed and finding out what these producers needed because they like to talk to their veterinarians or a veterinarian. And so we thought that's a great place to start. Um, we had to work with, um, and I worked with Sask Agriculture and the SVMA on this disposal of dead stock, um, because how do you get rid of hundreds of deads? You know, one, two, maybe you will be able to bury, but when you have this many, you have environmental concerns and you need to get environmental engineers out and you need to figure out what, what you're going to do. And one of the other problems is we don't have the rendering facility in, in Saskatchewan anymore. So now animals have to be trucked to Alberta. Um, and when you have thousands that you have to get picked up, it's just, you can't do it in a, in a timely fashion. 
and biosecurity was a big issue. Um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we weren't spreading any type of disease. Um, things go, th you know, yes, the fire kills lots of things, but also other things can rear their ugly heads. Veterinary services were of concern because there's not a lot of veterinary practices out that way. There's a big hole. And then the mental health of all the professionals involved, not just the veterinary professionals, um, the RCMP, the firefighters, the the far the grain farmers who just jumped in a tractor with a disker and started helping and the producers and and the next picture you will see will will make you very sad and I, I apologize, but this is your graphic picture warning. So cows couldn't couldn't escape, we couldn't cut fences fast enough to get these animals, you know, to be able to run run free and, and get away. Um, so, you know, there's animals trying to get away and they just get caught up in the fire. So, like I said, there was no local renderer um, and Lethbridge wouldn't be able to handle it in a timely fashion. Um, it took a really long time to figure out what to do with the dead stock because this is something we hadn't dealt with before. Um, so, Sask Agriculture did help the RMs to with where to put burial pits and we did have environmental engineers out and uh, two to three massive pits were dug to bury these animals that had perished. And like I said, some producers did bury their own livestock. So what did we do on the mental emotional support side? We, um, the veterinary so, uh, social worker did do up some fact sheets and contact information and it was sent out to the authorities. Um, so all the emergency personnel and the RMs to pass out to the residents and volunteers. Um, I kept in touch with the veterinarians that were dealing with the disaster. Um, there was a few of them and just talked to them on a regular basis and seen how things were going um, and letting them know about the resources we had available. And then recovering. So the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association had the wildfire fund established, which was amazing. Um, there was many fall supper fundraisers, the communities, of course, typical Saskatchewan style, we just pull together and we help each other out. And networks. So we had networks of support built, we met more people, we reached out, we were we were more prepared, we've learned even more after this one of what we can do. And of course, this affected livestock more than the, the companion animal side. And of course, that always means more meetings. So I did meet with with the RMs. Um, we met in Richmond with several RMs and we just talked about this fire. Um, I shared it some information about Fort Mac and my personal experience, even being a livestock producer with a, you know, one of those little fires that takes off, um, you know, somebody burning garbage or, or burning a quarter of land, um, farmland and the fire takes off the wrong way. And so I'd learned some things about that as well. Um, talked about the logistics and how we can apply them to rural Saskatchewan and about the veterinary services and the biosecurity and animal health now. So there's still, especially with livestock, there's so many lingering effects that we didn't know what were gonna happen. We didn't know whether those bred cows were gonna start aborting um, or you know, whether lung issues come winter time were gonna be a problem. What were those calves gonna look like in a feedlot um, you know, after being surviving the fire and maybe even just being in the, in the way of the smoke. You know, maybe they weren't even near the fire and they still had the smoke coming through. We know with all of those fires, we tend to get smoke migrating all over the province. Um, so that was another thing that we had to, we had to think about. Um, there were so many services that were donated. There was farmers who got their diskers out and I know other people who had water trucks and were trying to help make fire breaks and deal with, um, trying to stop the fire and get ahead of it. And uh, all of those people donated their time and they donated their equipment um, and had to do major repairs to equipment. So we know now that whatever value they came up with was the cost, you know, the RM's cost or the pr province's cost for fighting these fires. There's also all of those in-kind things that people don't, um, don't think about that we need we need to keep track of. So even if it's in kind, we do need to know how much those things cost so we can plan. Um, we did go on a tour of the area affected and it was a, a lot of black ground. 
um, and there was feed issues. There was no pasture. The feedstocks, many feedstocks were destroyed. There was grain and grain land that were destroyed and it's gonna take a few years for those to get back to producing good quality feed and good quality grains and good quality pasture. And of course, fences, just plain fences were just gone. And if anyone's like me, we do not like fencing. I do not like fencing. <laughs> so um, it's never a fun task to do. So in 2019, of course, we got reports that the Argo bush was on fire outside of Bigger. And it's, you know, a nice little, nice little area. Um, so it took a big chunk of, big chunk of land. So here's an aerial shot of that. And there was a concern for livestock and human safety again. So um, I reached out to the local veterinarians and said, hey, if you get too many calls and you can't handle it, let me know. I've got a backup plan. I will get you extra help if animals start getting into trouble. Um, Sask Agriculture was starting to work with other, other ministries using the premise ID numbers to do mapping to figure out who might have been in the line of destruction had this fire got any bigger. So we were all starting to work together naturally right at the very beginning. The stock growers reactivated the wildfire relief fund and we were prepared for the worst. So we were already had the social worker piece started. We had the Sask agriculture started. We had the veterinary care started. We we're already working with emergency personnel at the very beginning and we were prepared for the worst. Um, it was progress again, not a formalized process, but we got somewhere. We did a little bit better this time. So then we have to think about what happens in winter storms. And these pictures that I'm going to show you aren't from Saskatchewan. Um, I think these are actually from the States. Um, but we get those lovely winter storms that come through. And April 2019 was a, was a good example of that. Um, producers were unable to get to their cattle because they had to plow snow to get to them big snow drifts and, you know, deep snow and the cattle can't get out and people can't get to them. And it's during calving season. Um, you know, some dead stock aren't found till after the snow is melted and animals are, are displaced and wandering. And, um, and that's tough. And it's, it's really tough to ensure that animal welfare is upheld um, because these producers are doing the majority of producers are doing everything they can to make sure their animals are well taken care of. But then you have um, mother nature throwing a, a monkey wrench into that whole plan. And so, um, you know, trying to ensure that that animal welfare is upheld and rectify the sa situation as soon as possible is really important, but also the human safety aspect is important. So as a producer, if, if I have to try to go out, if it's not safe for me to go out, I can't help my animals if I'm going to harm myself. Um, but we try to work with veterinarians and animal protection services um, and, and raise that public awareness piece that sometimes these things happen and it's, it's not intentional. So a little bit about incident command. Um, so ISC, ICS is a standardized um, management system. And it is, and there's the official definition, but it is a chain of command. It is trying to make sure that all the resources, um, everything that's needed to deal with an emergency are, it's all organized and strategic so that it helps maintain the health and safety of, of people first and dealing with the emergency um, in a systematic manner. So it is used to manage incidents uh, or non-emergencies um, and can be used equally for small and large situations. And of course, it's to ensure the health and safety of responders and others, and then deal with the incident and be effective with the use of resources. So how do we deal with all of this? Um, it's baby steps. So we um the other place incident command is used is actually with the canadian food inspection agency or the animal health unit when they deal with disease outbreaks they use the same the same piece the same um emergency type plans um 
So we have a small working group um, and we've been working with myself, the Saskatchewan SPCA, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Vet College, um, the Sask Emergency Planning Association that we're trying to help with building templates and building public awareness, um, you know, preparing household and farm emergency plans um, and and having templates available for dealing with these big disasters now that we've learned so much information. So what are we gonna do? Um, if there's a large scale emergency again, is we're gonna allow the incident command system to do its job. We're gonna get involved. Uh, we're gonna offer offer help. Um, We're gonna hopefully avoid the rogue rescuers that go in there um, to try to keep everybody safe. We're gonna use that systematic approach and we're gonna follow the instructions of emergency personnel. And um, oh, of course, hold on, hold on, I'm getting click happy over here. Um, so we do, we're, we're trying to work together and we have a great group of people and uh, and COVID's definitely thrown a, a big monkey wrench into everything. So we are definitely trying to, to get the momentum back up and running before forest fire season starts again, or the mass floods that we may get, although we don't have a lot of snow this year and it's a really dry year. So hopefully we can avoid um, some of the flooding, but with a dry year, we may have more issues with forest fires. We don't know. And of course, thanks, <laughs> thanks Ray. Uh, so another one, uh, we're working with the Sask Public Safety Agency as well. Um, that's another big, they've been a huge resource for us as well with, with working on um, doing some emergency planning things to, to prepare everybody for when animals are involved with emergencies. So that's kind of my story. Um, it was, it definitely takes a toll on everybody's, you know, mental health and mine. I wouldn't change it for the world. I'd be back in there again, helping um, and using my knowledge and skills at any point in time, because um, maybe I, I live for it <laughs> on the dangerous side. Um, but it's, it's definitely a fulfilling piece to be able to get involved with it. It's just knowing, you know, knowing that there's support and there's resources out there. So um, I see that there's um, there's no questions in the Q and A, but I do see one here. I'm just gonna try to so we did have a question about you know who can you call for planning assistance. Um, this is a part um, we've learned is before until there's um you know formalized pieces every every rural municipality should have should have some sort of template for dealing with emergencies but then when it comes to evacuating pets um and animals it becomes a place that we don't have anything formalized right now and so who can you call for planning assistance um i mean there's me um the saskatchewan spca has a list of everybody who we've been dealing with um that they can be able to, um, you know, help with some of those pieces as well. Um, it's really building that networking um, and working with the people around you. Um, I mean, I can definitely talk to you afterwards about some of the different um, ideas and plans and kind of places to go and kind of where to get the ball rolling. Um, but sometimes it's very, diff it's, it depends on the location you're in because, you know, we have resources all over the province. Um, the other question I have is about the wildlife piece. Um, so of course, with any emergency, we didn't, I didn't deal as much on the wildlife side. Um, but we do have, you know, conservation officers are, you know, part of that whole, um, process as well being government employees. Um, they are definitely part of that emergency response piece when they're needed. Um, they don't have a lot of them. Um, the wildlife rescues, um, work do work with conservation officers as well to deal with um, some of the wildlife things that come up as well. So um, we haven't had as much to do with that piece of it yet, um, but I do have resources. Um, definitely do have some resources and I, I do know uh, quite a few of the 
the conservation officers that are, are working in the province and they are definitely a, a great resource and can, you know, help us when we need to. And, and there's some really good wildlife rescues out there too. So that's, um, that's about all I'll say about that one. Anything else, everybody? I know I went through it really fast and of course I'm really nervous. So I just want to make sure that we got to got everything in here for everybody. I hope you all had sort of enjoyed it in a, you know, weird, creepy, I showed a lot of really sad pictures, but um, I hope you everybody got something out of it and enjoyed hearing my story. And uh, like I said, I am available for questions. Um, you can email them to me. Um, and I'm more than happy, more than happy to help. Um, I have the experience from a couple of different disasters and we have a great resource pool of people that if I can't answer it and we need help, we definitely can help. And um, there's another question. Is there plans written out for how to evacuate forms to use? I actually, we are working on all of the, the evacuation type plans, some example forms, all of that kind of stuff um, to keep track of the animals and where they came from, how to get them back. Um, we started with the High River Flood. They started some templates, um, shared those. We improved those for Fort McMurray. Um, and now we have, we have even more information and we're able to use it um, to offer as templates. So I do have a stash of templates and information. So we are willing to share all of that information to help people in the future because it's a lot of work and we really appreciate everybody who is willing to help these animals um of course doing so in a safe manner so yeah i hope everybody enjoys the rest of the series i think the other talks are going to be amazing um and really good for everybody to learn even more about the different aspects of the uh, different emergencies and different different pieces of the emergency response um, and how to deal with them. So we've got some really good talks coming up and um, I hope you all enjoy them. Thank you, Lorraine. That was really great. Uh, I think it's a reminder too to all of us that uh, emergencies can strike at any time and uh, as much work as we can do now to prepare uh, and to be ready should that situation uh, occur, uh, it's a great reminder of that. And um, I think if you don't mind, Lorraine, I. Would you mind sharing your email address in the chat for folks that oh, you want to reach Not out? at all. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> forgive me if I look like I wasn't looking at everybody. I have two screens going. So it's, you know, go bouncing back and forth between my presentation and making sure I knew what I was supposed to be saying. <laughs> and as Lorraine mentioned, we have two other webinars coming up this week, tomorrow and Thursday at 10 a.m. So if you uh, are joining us, we look forward to seeing you. But if you aren't, there's still time to register, I believe. Um, and tomorrow's presentation, it's called It Takes the Community to Respond to an Emergency. And our guest speaker will be Ray Unruh from the uh, Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency. And then on Thursday, we have um, a presentation uh, from a farmer in the Richmond area who uh, will share his experiences during the 2017 Burstall area fires that Lorraine had referenced. Uh, plus, we will be hearing from Lauren Van Uick, uh, who will talk about finding healing and the emotional impact of crisis and loss of people who love animals. So some great topics coming up here uh, later this week. Um, again, if you're interested in learning more about those, you can visit our website, saskspca.ca slash conference. And uh, again, thank you to everybody who has taken the time to join us today. And uh, we really appreciate your support. And uh, hopefully we'll see you later this week. Thank you, Lorraine. Yes, thanks, everybody. Much appreciated.